Three Bengal tigers have been born in captivity in northern Peru. They were born within hours of each other to two different mothers. The mother tigers, Kaloa and Data, were part of the African circus of wild animals in Piura, Peru, which is located 2,000 kilometers north of Lima. The first litter was born at six in the morning to Kaloa, who had a baby tigress. Six hours later, Data gave birth to two male tigers, one week prematurely. All of the Bengal tigers, including the two first-time mothers, were reported to be in good condition. The circus has invited Peruvians to mail in suggestions for the cubs' names. Meanwhile, the circus reports that its greatest concern is figuring out how it's going to afford to feed the animals. Proclaimed a wonder horse, Funny Side runs for horse racing's Triple Crown in the Belmont Stakes. His owners hope to make a fortune from his winnings, but they will not benefit from a second career from their horse after his retirement. Funny Side was castrated while he was a foal for health reasons, and so cannot earn millions siring offspring at the stud farm. But researchers showed off Idaho Gem, the first cloned mule. Mules, the product of the union of a horse and a donkey, are always sterile. Could the same techniques be used to produce a clone of a gelding like Funnyside? One that would be fertile and so go on to the stud farm? Edward McKay, the cloning researcher from UCLA, says it's not out of the question. If his owners eventually choose to clone Funnyside, his stud stock could rise dramatically. Thoroughbred racing officials say while there may be a future in racing equine clones, the chance of clones running for the Triple Crown is slim to none. John Lee of the New York Racing Association says his organization prefers to leave nature in charge of thoroughbred reproduction. But that doesn't mean cloning has no place in horse racing. And that may be bad news for owners wanting to win the run for the roses, but if big time promoters picked up on the idea, cloned horse racing could take off like big time wrestling. Clones from such equine superstars like Secretariat, Seattle Slough and War Admiral could fight it out Las Vegas style and come out with millions in prize money. Bert Sugar, a veteran sports writer, says cloning viable racehorses may be possible, but isn't probable. Sugar says equine clones might be good for petting zoos or a circus. After school each day, Nine-year-old Tinakorn Hakpanya runs straight to lessons with his uncle Nulo Ta. He will spend the next couple of hours battling with one of Thailand's most deadly snakes. For generations, the residents of Koksan Ga, a village 400 kilometers north of Bangkok, 
have survived by travelling the country, putting on snake charming shows and peddling herbal medicines. The children grow up knowing the deadly reptiles as household pets and they slither unchecked around the village, much to the horror of visiting tourists. The moment they are old enough, boys such as Tinicorn must begin learning charming skills, traditional training that is passed down from generation to generation. For the shows, they are taught how to antagonize the snakes into attacking them, and then how to dodge the venomous snakes. The process of handing down the traditional techniques is vital as long as the village continues to rely on the snake shows to supplement the income they make from farming. The king cobra can grow up to 5.5 meters. It is the largest venomous snake, poisonous enough to kill an elephant. Villagers insist that because of their long knowledge of the snakes, very few people get injured. They say around here, far fewer performers have been killed by snakes than by motorcycle accidents. Tarbuta is founder of the village's King Cobra Club. This club was set up to promote cobra conservation and works closely with wildlife foundations in the region. For the villagers, the cobras are a symbol of success and wealth. The quality, size and skill of your snakes will represent your standing within the village hierarchy. Any villager who gets a big new king cobra is proud. They have a celebration. It's a status symbol. It is just like people abroad who have big and expensive dogs. Daisy was born prematurely after a pregnancy of only 33 days. Daisy had her first camera appearance at a small zoo outside Berlin. The tidy, still naked baby kangaroo weighs only 350 grams and is the size of a kitten. It's being bottle fed by her adoptive father, the head of Batsado Zoo. At first, Zoo authorities weren't sure if the baby would survive. Despite the fact that they bottle-fed it every three hours, it wasn't drinking much. But after a few days, Daisy was drinking more and more, and the intervals between feeds were extended. Daisy now receives a special baby bottle of milk.
This milk with added vitamins is given to Daisy four times a day. If everything goes according to plan, it won't be long before Daisy is able to leave her baggy home permanently. Until then, Daisy's handler, Hamad Richter, will have to do with less sleep than is his custom. He says because of Daisy, there's no afternoon naps for him. The Little Poor Hotel is a vacation home for pets that are used to the royal treatment. Dogs are put up in double or single rooms at this hotel, depending on how well they get along with the other residents and depending on the size of their owner's wallet. The Little Poor Hotel owners stress that their rooms are similar to hotel rooms for humans and no dog or cat is kept in a cage or behind bars. The aim is to create an atmosphere as close to home as possible. Animation programs such as swimming and diving lessons ensure that guests never get bored. Guests can swim in the pool, there's a sports ground outside, and they can jump over obstacles and play. Thanks to the internet, the guests' owners have the possibility of checking up on their loved ones, even from the remotest of places. Web cameras installed in the pets' rooms and playgrounds switch continuously. The Little Paul Hotel's owners agree that you have to love your animals to do something like this. But they have a variety of clients. It's not just VIPs who bring their pets here. It's those who love their animals and aren't afraid of the cost. After arriving from China, giant pandas Yaya and Lili seemed unaffected by the throngs of people straining to get a look at one of the most critically endangered species in the world. They were doing what they do best, crunching on succulent bamboo. Yaya and Lili will be staying here in Memphis for years as research is done to help save their environment and unlock the secrets of their feeding habits. While pandas are peaceful creatures, they can be aggressive. Their jaws are very strong for crunching bamboo. And pandas eat all the time. Fewer than 1,000 are left now in the wild. If you've ever wondered what is on the mind of your precious pet dog, wonder no longer. A Japanese toy manufacturer has come up with what is called the Baolingual, or the world's first computerized translator of the canine language. It doesn't really interpret words or phrases. As far as we know, dogs don't have any language per se. But this new toy from the land of the gadgets senses the dog's emotions through a voice print or the timbre of its bark and whines. Through a microphone attached to the dog's collar, the pet's emotional state is deciphered. 
and that information is sent via infrared beam to the owner's canine emotion pager, translating the noises into different emoticons. So far they've identified six different basic emotions in dogs. Frustration, anger, relaxation, happiness, sadness and a feeling of accomplishment. Although the question of whether dog owners really need a machine to understand these feelings may be a moot point, the manufacturers of this gadget feel it could be a new beginning in communication between other species. Thousands of crocodiles are under threat, scientists say, because of a decision made to divert a river bordering Argentina and Paraguay. Both countries decided to open canals in the Pilcamea River to divide equally their waters. The low water levels have forced thousands of crocodiles to search for water and food in the centre of the lagoons where the animals bury themselves in the mud and those who are too weak from lack of food are trapped. Area farmers and local natives have begun removing and killing the largest and weakest crocs to provide meat for the younger and stronger crocs who have a better chance of survival. At the same time, they are easing the congestion of crocodiles in the lagoons. They've adopted a method called controlled hunting to save the species. The government has approved the controlled hunt of two and a half thousand crocodiles. Guns are prohibited, forcing locals to enter the water barefoot and use a walking stick to feel for crocodiles. When they find them, they measure the crocs using their hands. Once the size is identified, they harpoon the animals and pull them closer so another hunter can hit them on the head. The hunters say the crocodiles die about 30 seconds after being hit the first time. The bodies are then taken to shore where they are skinned and the meat is removed. The skins are then salted and dried in the sun. The locals sell the crocodile skins and use some of the profits to build a sanctuary where the surviving crocodiles can live. Around these parts, crocodiles can measure up to 2.5 metres in length and weigh up to 150 kilos as adults. The Pilcamea River originated in the Bolivian Andes ran through Argentina and Paraguay until both countries agreed to open canals to divide equally its waters. The Paraguayan side of the canal, notably smaller than the Argentine side, was filled with sediment brought by heavy currents and since then most of the water has kept to the Argentine side. Thousands of endangered Aru turtles have been released into the Orinoco River in Venezuela as part of a massive conservation effort. The Aru turtle, also known as the giant South American river turtles, are side-necked turtles, which can grow to weigh over 45 kilos and be 90 centimeters long.
Native to North and South America, the turtles are endangered because local residents traditionally eat their meat and eggs. Despite massive conservation efforts, only two cases of poaching have ever been taken to trial. These turtles are considered an endangered species, and government conservation projects intend to increase their numbers in their native Orinoco and Amazon River systems. The Venezuelan project has successfully transferred over 100,000 animals to the wild. The turtles nest by traveling in large groups to an area, and each turtle lays 90 to 100 eggs on the sandbank before returning to their feeding ground. Enjoying an afternoon siesta, these lions in a Beijing wildlife park have no idea they've been hand-picked to replace Mahjan at Kabul Zoo as a diplomatic peace offering. Beijing Badaling Safari Animal World have chosen two young lions from almost 80 African lions. Female Kaini and male Zhuang Zhuang are the chosen candidates. It was no easy task replacing Mahjan, who ruled Kabul Zoo for over 40 years. But Afghanistan's ambassador to China, Abdul Bazir Hutak, visited the Beijing Wildlife Park to check out the successes. At their current home, these lions consume 3.5 kilos of prime beef every day. During the war in Afghanistan, Mahjan was left in appalling conditions. He became blind in one eye, lame and almost toothless. Despite this, the country believes now is a good time to bring lions back to the zoo. Kabul Zoo is one of the main sources of entertainment for the citizens and inhabitants of Kabul. Keepers at the zoo believe the lions will be able to face up to the rigors of life in Afghanistan. The park also hopes these lions will produce an heir in Kabul. Many operators hope to provide the Kabul Zoo with many more lions in the future.